On December 15, 2012, Sambat Sampong, a Lao educator and development worker, was abducted in front of a police post in Ventian, the capital of the Lao People's Democratic Republic, one of the last remaining communist states left in the world. His kidnapping was recorded on police CCTV, and a copy of it quickly went viral. The footage stunned the world. The Lao police and the Lao government denied any involvement. This is Sambat's story. I met Sambat around 1976, immediately after the end of the uh, Vietnam War. In the early 1970s, people in Laos were just simply fed up with Vietnam War. There was a widespread feeling that they had had enough of war, that Lao, as good Buddhists, should not be killing other Lao, uh, and all they wanted was peace. My first impressions of Sombat were that he was a really committed and dedicated person to have come back to Laos I had come from working with refugees, and it seemed like it was a one-way street of Lao people who were leaving the country. And here was a guy who had instead chose to come back. Actually, Sambad was convinced that Laos could be a model for an alternative development, that there were other ways of, of doing things where you can reduce poverty, but also empower the people for their own development. I met Sombat at the University of Hawaii. Um, we were students, um, and I was always with a group of um, friends from Vietnam, Cambodia, and he's a Lao, so he joined us uh, on some occasions, and we became friends. I had a scholarship from the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies to do my PhD there with the request that I focus my study on Vietnam so that I will be their kind of specialist on Vietnamese studies when I return to work at the Institute in Singapore. Sumbad was following a master's course in agronomy. His interests had always been in agriculture because he was a farm boy. I did not notice Sombat very much uh, when I first met him because he's very quiet. He's also physically very small. He doesn't say very much. But later I noticed that this is a serious young guy. At a certain time, he'll ask some very, very incisive questions. So it was only after that that I noticed him uh, more. I had never thought that I would end up really with somebody and would spend the rest of my life with him. Than Sombat, everyone knows the problem of all the problems. But in the truth, the problems of all the problems are the same as the problems. ผมทุกข์อันนี้ทางด้านสากลจะเน้นใจไล่ครับที่บอกสูงพอหาประเทิง
ผมทุกกายทุกใจและทุกปัญญาสามด้านนี้ถาว่าการพัฒนาและการศึกษาของเฮลนี่ส่งเสริมให้คนวิจากทุกกายวิจากทุกใจและก็เสริมพลังปัญญาเข้าไปน้ำกันนี่ถาได้สามอย่างนี้พร้อมกันแบบสมดุลนี่เขาจะถึงความสุขแบบถาวรหรือว่าวัฒนาถาวรอันนั้นความยินยงของการพัฒนาลาวส์ is located in Southeast Asia, landlocked by China, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. For the Lao people, their complex history dates back before the mid 14th century, with the founding of the Lanzan Kingdom. This Lao kingdom ruled the land until it was conquered by the Siamese in the 1800s. The French then moved in and further dominated the Lao by making them part of their Indochina colonial empire. Samba was born into this story in 1952, the eldest son of a farming family who lived close to the Mekong River. Samba was bright and eager to learn, so he was encouraged to get an education through the French school system. Meanwhile. Next door in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh was waging the first Indochina war against the French, determined to rid the country of their colonial rule. Finally, in 1954, Ho Chi Minh defeated the French at Tien Bien Phu, and the country was free of foreign control. Laos also gained its full independence from France. But it chose to become a constitutional monarchy, while Vietnam became a communist state. As soon as the French pulled out, fighting began between the Lao royalist and the local Lao communist, the Patet Lao. The Patet Lao claimed the Lao monarchy, and the Lao government associated with it were corrupt. Somebody grew up experiencing what it is to live as a refugee. There were times in his life that his family has to escape from the fighting. Because they are farmers, they don't want to pick sides, they don't want to go with the Patet Lao or go with the royalist government. After Lao's independence, America soon got involved in the region as well, hoping to block communism from further spreading in Southeast Asia. In 1963, Laos was just beginning to be drawn into the Second Indochina War, that is the Vietnam War. There was a neutralist prime minister uh, backed by the United States, but already there was a communist insurgency up in the northeast of the country, which was beginning to be more active. America's involvement in Laos at the time became known as a secret war. It consisted of the CIA training a guerrilla force of Laotian hill tribesmen, the Hmong, to fight the North Vietnamese who were moving supplies and men along the Ho Chi Minh Trail into South Vietnam to fight the U.S. forces that were there. And to support this secret war, the United States dropped more than two million tons of ordnance over a 10-year period, making Laos the most heavily bombed country per capita in recorded history. Both Somban and I, we had come from a generation of students which were anti-war. We were really abhorred by the severe bombing which was going on. Our interest was to see peace return to the people of these nations. And it is up to them to build their nation. I guess we were idealistic. The Vietnam War ended in April 
1975. With, and then the American presence withdrew from Vietnam. Laos was also very much influenced by the Americans. But when the Americans lost Vietnam, they also withdrew from Laos. After Saigon fell, the Lao Communist Party quickly gained control of the government and on December 2nd, 1975, declared the country independent of all foreign powers and established the Lao People's Democratic Republic, a brand new single party communist state. The core group at the top of the Pantit Lao regime were made up of people who had been attracted to Marxism-Leninism as an ideology. Some of them had formerly been students in France, some were truck drivers, some of them were members of the Lao aristocracy, and some of them were formerly in the French administration. As the Vietnam War came to an end, the Patet Lao portrayed themselves as devoted to the cause of the people, as a, a, an organization that had the people's welfare, at heart. When the day took over, people didn't really know what to expect. They were told that there would be re-education for government officials and so on, uh, that this would be brief. That was not the case, however, because anyone whom the party suspected could be influential in opposing it, was kept in those re-education camps for years and years. Between 1975 and, say, 1982, something like 90% of the educated class that had worked for the former regime left the country. That set the development of the country back by a whole generation, at least. And that was the real tragedy of the effect of the war on Laos. At the end of the Vietnam War, there were also many urban Vietnamese, Cambodians and Laotians who left as refugees because they were concern about uh, the takeover by the um, communists in their respective governments. So as students studying outside of uh, Indochina, particularly the Vietnamese and the Laotian students, they were very concerned about what is happening in their country. Some were obviously from families that did not want anything to do with the new regimes. But there were some neutral students who were at loss as to what they should be doing. Should they go back to their home countries or should they remain outside? I think Sombat is definitely a nationalist, but he was politically neutral, and he is really proud to be a Lao. I remembered when I visited his room at the University of Hawaii, he had a Lao flag on his wall. It struck me as something quite unusual. Not only did he have a Lao flag, he also had a sketching that he made himself of Gai Son Pung Vi Han, who is the founder of the Lao nation. I asked Sambat why did he put that up. He told me he's Lao, and his country now has a new president and a new flag. He thought that he should remind himself and other Lao people who come and visit him that they are all Lao, and they should love this new country. Chen Sun Bolvihan was the mastermind of the takeover of power in Laos. He believed that Marxism-Leninism could speed up 
the process of development in underdeveloped countries. He believed that socialism did not exploit the people in the way that capitalism did. I think he was genuine in his hopes that he could make a difference, but he was wrong about the effectiveness of Marxism-Leninism. Somebody came back to Laos for the first time in 1978. He was given a ticket by the Lao government because the government was actively trying to attract Lao students who are studying overseas, both in the US, in America, and in France, to come back to Laos. And he spent about three months in Laos. Uh, they were sent to a re-education camp where they had to study Marxism, Leninism, and what the new government wants to do, what the government hopes to achieve. Well, he told me about his experience. He said it was very boring uh, because they were all put in a room and then uh, someone would come and read them long tracts about Marxism, Leninism. The instructors were also just reading off a text. And his impression is that they did not know very much beyond uh, the text they, they were reading. He did say that some of them are very sincere. Therefore, he thought that they're honest, but he was willing to give the new government time. They asked him whether he wants to stay. He said, I, I'm not going to stay right now because he wanted to finish his degree first. And they let him go back to Hawaii. Sombad decided that he would come back and live in Laos. Because he knew he was coming back, he was not serious about having a relationship, especially with a foreign woman, uh, knowing that it would probably be difficult to start a family in Laos. So we were friends for a long time. Actually, he did not ask me to be with him and live with him and come back to Laos with him. But I asked him, I said, what do you want to do? You know, we have been hanging around for quite a while. I said, why don't we talk about this and be frank about this? I want to know exactly um, what his plans were. Then he said he wanted to come back to Laos and he didn't feel that I would want to come back to Laos with him. So I didn't answer him. I thought for a while, yeah, you know, what? Leave Singapore, go to Laos. I don't have any clue what Laos is. So we left it for a while and I graduated. I came back to Singapore. Uh, but we continued to correspond. And he said, come back to visit. Um, because we were missing each other a lot. So I went back um, to visit him in Hawaii. And then he said, why, you know, why don't you consider to come to Laos? Samba and Xu Ming finally got married in Hawaii and finally made up their minds to move to Laos in the early 80s. For Sambat, he was home. For Xu Ming, it took some getting used to. In the beginning, it was not easy. I mean, Vientiane was less than a village. There were about two noodle stores open at that time. Electricity was not guaranteed. There wasn't very much in-your-face kind of communism. Yeah, there were some um, public announcements in the morning, you know, we had you every evening blaring through the public speakers, but it really did not affect many people's lives. You know, somehow you know the political system is there, 
but you can turn a blind eye and, and have a, you know, a fairly normal life. Saban Shuming soon discovered, however, that leading a normal life in Laos was not going to be easy on many levels. For one thing, since the end of the war, the high socialist ideals of the Politburo had almost run the country's economy into the ground. By 1980, it was a different country entirely. It was a country under the total control of the Palau People's Revolutionary Party, intent on creating a socialist economy. And they did that through nationalizing industry, through state control of all services, a control of the economy, the markets, and so on, and the corporativization of agriculture. They wanted Laos to be a country modeled on the Soviet Union and Vietnam. By 1985, it was evident that corporativization of agriculture was just not working. Productivity crashed. The Lao are not naturally inclined to Marxism-Leninism. They're Buddhist, uh, and they didn't take kindly to the termination of all public, private property, for instance. Um, they thought that if you work the land, uh, you should have the just deserts of your labor, and that it should not be expropriated by the state. Uh, and so there was a lot of opposition. So this led to the introduction of limited market economy. With the introduction of a market economy, Laos, almost overnight, opened up to the world. Foreign aid with no strings attached was welcome, and foreign investment encouraged. The reform was economic reform only. So there were economic opportunities, and these allowed individuals, for instance, the sons of powerful politicians within the party, to begin businesses and to exploit the natural production in Laos, and so the economy began to take off. What crept back in was the old Lao system of political patronage. It meant that the economy became monopolized by the party and the families of party members. In order to start up a business in Laos, you had to be part of the patronage network of a powerful party official. ในการตัดสินใจเกี่ยวกับโครงการพัฒนาใดหนึ่งภาคประชาสังคมควรให้เปรียบเหมือนกับรัฐบาลแนวใดแด่จะให้ผู้เดียวผู้เป็นส่ว
important and significant jobs were those who had a revolutionary pedigree. And Somba did not have a revolutionary pedigree, nor did he have the sort of family connections that might have got him a position in government. So quite early on, Somba realised that even to work in Laos, um, it may be difficult for him unless he had support to do his own work. This was why he decided to try to do things outside of the government. To find work, Slumbad quickly established a relationship with the American Friends Service Committee, a US-based Quaker group that famously opposed the war in Vietnam and was invited by the Lao government to continue operating in the country after the war. Somba wanted to do his own agricultural project. He wanted to be independent, but Laos had no mechanism for local non-governmental organizations to be set up. So what we were able to do with Quaker Service Laos was have him operate under our umbrella to provide a, a mechanism for Somba to develop a project and have a sort of an institutional home. Sombat's early work was bringing new agricultural techniques to Laos, methods that hadn't been tried in the country before. He called it rice-based integrated farming systems. So it was looking at rice and vegetable production and doing it in an ecologically sustainable way. But the Lao government people didn't know what to make of them at first. I, on one hand, they welcomed having uh, an aid project and, and uh, assistance, but there was a lot of suspicion and mistrust of what his agenda was. Ironically, he would tell me that in Hawaii, all the, the Laos students thought he was a communist, and then he got back to, to Laos and they all thought he was a spy or something because they just nobody else was doing the types of agricultural techniques he was doing. Sombat is, is not a confrontational kind of guy. He's not here to contest any of the government ideas or agenda. He just wants to contribute. Some people describe him as a visionary. Salba was one of the first in the country to use media to help educate farmers. He quickly put a video team together and started making films. There are a lot of good practices of sustainable development in the world. The problem is that we are not linking the dots of these best practices. And digital technology, I think, play, can play a very important role here. For example, it can demonstrate that a good practice in one place can be captured digitally and then replay and show in other places. One of the first films they made, initiated under Quaker Service Laos, was about pine reforestation up at the Plain of Jars. He worked with a village on the outskirts of the, of the provincial capital of, of Ponsavan. He got them to start planting pine seedlings to try to avoid erosion. I think people were real skeptical of it at first, and both the local agricultural officials and the villagers themselves, but they were still willing to try. And I, I was skeptical myself. It turned out that it, it worked really well. The provincial government liked the project, and especially liked the film so much, they asked Sambad and his team to make more films. Sambat continued to work in Laos over the next three decades, gaining the trust of the Lao people and many in the Lao government. In the early 90s, he was granted permission to open the first Lao non-government organization. He called it PEDEC, short for Participatory Development Training Center. planning process to the government system and demonstrate to them that by planning with the participation of the community, 
the community will take ownership of the project. And when they take ownership, they take better care of the project. Sambat Soma's revolutionary concept of taking ownership for your actions quickly caught on, especially among the Lao youth. When I met Sombat, I, I was studying in the high school. I was a volunteer for PADEC. Usually he worked really close with the media team already. Then I just came and worked with the media team and then I got to know him. For me, what I learned from him, I can say Sombat is my hero, one of my heroes. He always say, oh, I, I, I keep, I throw the people to the swimming pool or to the river. Then you have to learn how to swim. As Padek grew and took on more projects, Sambat developed a model for sustainable development that was uniquely Lao. I think in order to have harmony in our society, we should use happiness as our ultimate goal of development. In order to reach that, we need to have a balance between economic development, social development, environmental harmony, and most important of all is the development of our young people. Over the years, Sampa and Padek won numerous awards for the work in the Lao provinces, as well as many regional and international awards. In 2005, he won the prestigious Raymond Megsese Award which many consider the Asian Nobel Prize. This award is not just for me or for my staff in Padek. This award is also for our young Lao volunteers and youth leaders who have demonstrated to us, the adults, that they have the capacity and indeed the right to claim the space to determine their own and their community's development pathway. As Laos entered the 21st century, the Lao government made the decision to lift the country out of poverty through aggressively turning its land and natural resources into capital. Large areas of land were taken by private companies. There were massive evictions and environmental destruction. Sambat had no choice but to become more vocal of the development policy. I think the Politburo in Laos has been quite clever in the way that it has encouraged economic development but refused categorically to institute any kind of political reforms. The party retains total control over the media, over education, over all forms of life in, in Laos. There is no independent civil society in Laos. I remember Sombat feeling really frustrated by the situation in Laos on many occasions. Just seeing the ill-conceived development, the growing corruption. He would be privately very critical of that and, and uh, talk about being disillusioned at times, but then but he always seemed to come back to be able to take it kind of with sort of a Buddhist tranquility and be able to get over it. I never saw him actually come close to wanting to give up. Thanh Sam Bat and Sam Lap Vai Nung Lao De, he has a few words about the future of the people. I want to say that the new one is the new one. The last time I saw Sombat on the 15th of December was uh, when he came to Sao Ban and um, he said, let's go home for dinner. Uh, I was driving in my own car, and he was driving in his Jeep following me. It was about maybe 6, 6.15 at that time. And we were going, more or less, we were going home together. And we passed the police post. Then when I look back at my rear view mirror, 
I did not see Sombat's jeep anymore. So I arrived home. I arrived home possibly maybe a little bit after 6.30. And he, he didn't come home. So I called his phone. And the message I got was that the phone was switched off. Again, I did not think about that too much uh, because sometimes somebody does that. He doesn't. He he forgets to switch on the phone. Um, and we wait. I waited. I waited. By about ten o'clock, I was really worried. Uh, and then about ten thirty, we decided to go out and look for him. So we took the car and drove up and down the road that, and th that we always drive on and where I have seen him all along until um, close to that police post. That same night, we also visited the hospitals, thinking that you know, he could have gotten in a, an accident and someone must have you know, taken him to hospital. Uh, but we were told that he was not Nobody of that description was admitted in any hospital and waited till morning. We then reported his missing to the local um, office, the local police station. The whole of Sunday, we looked for him. Uh, called his friends and called various places. Uh, nothing. On Sunday, when we were driving along, we noticed there were police cameras along the road. So we say, why don't we ask the police um, at the municipality police station uh, to see whether we can watch, we can look at some of the video cameras that they have along uh, Tada Road. We went uh, to the municipality police station. Yes, they have a video room. They asked us to go in and, and we reported, oh, you know, um, Somebody was missing, he was in this car, and uh, the last time we saw him was um, around 6.30, or six, a little bit before 6.30, and this was the road we drove on. And they said, okay, you know, we have police cameras along the way. And they switched on the police camera, and we saw that he was stopped at the police post. The police were standing next to his car, probably asking him to get down from his, from his jeep to go into the police post. Then we saw next um, a man in, dressed in a dark jacket in a motorcycle came by, stopped the motorcycle in front of Sombat's um, jeep ran into the police post and came out and drove Sombat's jeep away. Then later, a white truck with flashing light came by the police was waving for the, uh, the truck to stop right in front of the police post. And the next thing we saw two or three people, one of them was Sombat, getting into the white jeep. And the white jeep drove away in a hurry. Um, it, was, it already started moving before even the car door was closed. It was clearly caught on camera uh, that the jeep was driving away just as they were closing the, the car door. And that was the last time somebody was seen. They were very junior police officers minding the uh, video room. And they were watching it themselves. And they were surprised. And we asked for the tape. They say no, they cannot give it to us. But they allow us to film the entire sequence. Then later, we saw a senior officer going into the video room asking the junior officers what's happening. 
and uh, junior officer, oh, these people say they, you know, they are, you know, their relative is lost, and we were showing them the videotape. Then we sense that, you know, we better get out of the place. So we just left before the guy was able to stop us. We went back to the police station to see whether we can get the original tape. The video room was closed. The people who showed us the film were not there also. Nobody can enter the video room now. The cell phone copy of the CCTV footage quickly went viral. The images stunned the world. Outrage quickly followed. The Lao police and the government denied any involvement. The reaction from Lao civil society at first was disbelief, then shock, and then fear that this could happen to anyone in the country. Sumba Samphone became victim of an enforced disappearance. This kind of abduction is a breach of human rights. We call on the EU High Representative to closely monitor the case. It is absolutely crucial that the Lao authorities take all necessary steps to end arbitrary arrests. The world is watching this case very closely. Many point to Sambat's recent involvement in a people's forum held in Vientiane as the breaking point. The forum was attended by citizens from all over the world, including Lao nationals. It openly discussed land rights issues. Sambat gave a keynote speech that reflected his well-known beliefs. Sustainable development, along with good governance, was essential for the future of the country. Lao's security forces, however, appeared to find the meeting subversive and a threat to the state. At the forum, there were large numbers of plainclothes security agents. They were all over, taking photographs, taking notes. Eight weeks later, Sombat was disappeared. Basically, I think what, what you had at the Asia-Europe People's Forum was people spontaneously coming up to express their worries that their lands were being lost. And um, so I think in, in the mind of the Lao government that this was an organized um, effort uh, instead of a spontaneous effort, that there was a mastermind so my sense is that they thought that the mastermind was uh, Sombat, and that's when they acted. Rumors quickly spread through Ventiana of a blacklist with names on it of who was next. A number of people even fled to Thailand just in case the list was real. It was almost like being back in the 70s again when the communist path at Lao first took control of the country. As the days passed and Sambat remained missing, the diplomatic community sought answers from the Lao government. We were very closely in contact with, with Brussels headquarters the whole time. Everybody was very concerned and surprised. We were very much improving relations all the time with Laos and, and, and this was a backward step. The Lao government quickly issued a statement of concern and called for a police investigation. At the same time, they also suggested the kidnapping might be related to a private matter, over a conflict in business, perhaps. We had a high-level human rights dialogue with the Lao authorities after the disappearance of Sombat. And what we always do is we invite civil society to meet us, the EU side, so that we can hear uh, what the views are on the human rights in Laos. And what was surprising is how very few representatives actually turned up. Many were not prepared even to be seen in meeting with the European Union. <laughs> ในสังคมนี่ส่วนใหญ่ก็ญาติและก็คนหนุ่มคนสาวนี่หลายคนก็บ่อยากเบาถึง
เพราะว่าพ่อแม่หรือว่าครอบครัวเนี่ยก็เคยบอกว่าเรื่องนี้พ่อแม่เรื่องเล็กน้อยก็บทท้องเว้าก็ได้นอกก็เว้าแบบนี้ During the six-month period after Sambat's disappearance, the Lao government issued three official updates of the police investigation. Each update stated that Sambat nor any suspects or motive could be found, and that the investigation was continuing. The Lao government also refused any technical expertise that was offered, especially to help analyze the CCTV video for faces and license plates. They claimed nothing could be done to improve the image, so no outside help was necessary. There was a general reflection uh, as whether or not it would be useful to um, have sanctions against Laos. This was a matter that was discussed. But no particular measures were taken by anyone in the Western international community. Soon after Sambat's disappearance, members of Parliament from the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia met with the Lao government, seeking answers. When we went to Laos, was we wanted to see if we could um, uh, get the Lao government. To surface uh, some, but as quickly as possible, all the officials, uh, you know, we met um, said they didn't know what had happened, uh, but that the police was onto the case. So it was like going up against a blank wall all the time. But the visit made it very clear uh, to the officials in Laos that parliamentarians in ASEAN were concerned, and you know that. It was also um, a warning, you know, uh, not to touch him and to surface him as soon as possible. The Lao government remained silent on Sambat's case for another three years. Finally, in 2015, at its UN Human Rights Review in Geneva, various member states pressed for an update. The missing of Sambat Sampan is a shocking news for the Lao government. We have been wondering why he went missing exactly during this time. I would like to confirm that the Lao government has never had any hidden negative attitude toward him. His missing is concerned by the Lao government like the missing of any Lao citizen. Some organizations even made accusation that the Lao government might have been involved in the missing. These accusations can be refuted by referring to the mere fact that the incident happened in front of a police CCTV camera and the police authorities cooperate sincerely with his wife and relatives, allow them to view and record the CCTV footage. I would like to give assurance that the concerned authorities of the Lapidia are still seriously conduct conducting the investigation and will continue to do so. I don't pretend to know what happened to him or the reasons. What I think is more significant is the way in which the government has stalled over investigating so much disappearance. I mean, who could possibly be embarrassed by any revelations? That's the question I think that would have to be asked. I would like someone at least try to explain what does Samba do which has been so threatening. And if it's not threatening, if it was just an act of an individual, then, you know, find whoever has taken him. I think this is government's responsibility. Investigate openly and transparently. Find whoever who has taken Samba or where somebody is, and let him come home. I've always been an optimist. I think it's quite possible that there will be a younger, uh, much more open leadership that will emerge, and that then it will be a we will be in a position to find out a lot more about what really happened. 
I wouldn't presume to tell the Lao what to do. I'm a foreigner. It's their system. Uh, well, I, I, <laughs> what advice would I give to a young student returning from uh, study overseas back to Laos? I, I wouldn't have to give them any advice because they would know very well that the only way that they're going to have any influence on what happens in the country is to join the party. Find themselves a patron, interest that patron in some kind of reform measure and work their way up to the point where they can do something themselves. I think Laos has a lot of potential. Potential to develop its resources, potential to develop its people. All we need is a good strategy. I think we can lift ourselves out of poverty, the real poverty. I have no choice. I cannot remain silent. I cannot let the life work of somebody for building a better society in Laos and for the Lao people disappear like him. <laughs>